So I'd like to thank you for this wonderful invitation and thank all of you for coming this evening. It's a great pleasure and an honor to speak before you. In my lecture today, I want to lay out some of the problems and questions that drive my current research, and I hope that those of you who participated in today's Sensing Place event will recognize some shared concerns in my talk. As a post-colonial eco-critic, I'm interested in the intersections of three kinds of questions. Questions about literature and culture, about nature and environment, and about imperialism and globalization. I'm currently working on a book project entitled Reading for the Planet, World Literature and Environmental Crisis, where I examine literary and filmic representations of specific environmental crises, such as climate change, deforestation, petroleum extraction in the Niger Delta, the 1984 gas disaster in Bhopal, India, and the challenges faced by people in global megacities who inhabit what the radical historian Mike Davis has called slum ecologies. Given my disciplinary training as a literary critic, my particular, my particular intellectual interest in environmental crisis focuses on how different literary genres, narrative strategies, and other formal aspects of texts help to make the experience of environmental injustice imaginable, and perhaps more importantly, unimaginable, across vast geographic and experiential divides. Let me say a little more about this idea of the unimaginable, which for me is at the heart of the ethical stakes of my work. We often hear the word unimaginable used to mean something like extreme, and more, exp more specifically, extremely bad. A crisis or situation is so terrible, that it, it, uh, a cr sorry, a crisis or situation so terrible that it is, we say, unimaginable. For example, writing about the Niger Delta, the geographer Michael Watts argues that one of the horrors of the Delta is that the ultra-modernity of oil sits cheek by jowl with the most unimaginable poverty. Around the massive Escravos oil installation with its barbed wire fences, its security forces, and its comfortable houses are nestled shacks, broken down canoes, and children who will be lucky to reach adulthood. And I should say that I'm going to use a number of images that, uh, of the Niger Delta that come from this book, Curse of the Black Gold, 50 Years of Oil in the Niger Delta, and this was edited by the geographer Michael Watts, whom I mentioned. The photographs are by Ed Kashi. Another example of the Niger Delta being described as unimaginable appears in the work of my fellow post-colonial eco-critic Rob Nixon, author of the groundbreaking book Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor. Nixon writes about the challenges that activists like, like the late Ken Sarawiwa faced in garnering international support for their movements against physical and environmental violence by what Sarawiwa called the slick alliance of multinational oil companies in the Nigerian state. Um, among the most significant of these challenges, Nixon writes, were prejudicial failures of geographical imagining. In American intellectual and media terms, a region like Ogoniland is almost completely unimaginable, Nixon writes. I don't want to take these descriptions of the Niger Delta as unimaginable as f at face value, as the last word that tells us all we need to know. Rather, I want to think seriously and critically about these prejudicial failures of geographic imagining and to take those imaginative failures as a point of departure rather than as an end to thinking. To say that a situation is unimaginable is to describe suffering or harm so great as to evoke a sense of the sublime. In the face of the unimaginable, thought ceases, words fail, and the imagination pales. But how does a situation become unimaginable, beyond the capacity to be imagined or to imagine? What historical processes create situations that get described as unimaginable? What constraints on our thought processes and what constraints in the ways that images are framed and stories get told shape or limit our capacity to imagine? I'm interested in thinking about the unimaginable not only as an adjective that describes an existent state of affairs, but also in a transitive sense as a verb, an action, and a process that makes some things happen and keeps other things from happening. Unimagining, then, is a process through which something becomes unimaginable. The ethical stakes of unimagining, I would say, have to do with the withdrawal of attention 
that occurs precisely in the guise of paying attention to injustice, harm, and suffering. I want to suggest that to label something unimaginable is to contain it, to draw a comforting line of distance and difference around it, to pull back from the work of engagement, inquiry, understanding, disentangling and finding oneself entangled that might implicate a person in the network of uh, sorry, in the network of relations and historical processes that produce the situation deemed unimaginable. In other words, there's a close relationship between a spectacle of hypervisible suffering, so extreme that we deem it unimaginable, and forms of injustice or harm that go unnoticed and seem to be invisible. This is what Arundhati Roy has in mind, I think, with her account of contemporary globalization as a collective failure to pay attention that results in a metaphorical loss of vision. Roy writes, I think of globalization like a light, which shines brighter and brighter on a few people, and the rest are in darkness, wiped out. They simply can't be seen. Once you get used to not seeing something, then slowly it's no longer possible to see it. When the lives left when the lives of those left out of globalization's spotlight do come into view, I want to suggest all too often it's through the lens of the unimaginable, which is its own form of not paying attention. What the unimaginable and the invisible have in common is a failure of the imagination, a lack of sustained regard. But some things that seem invisible are actually hiding in plain sight, and other things that seem hypervisible remain for our all practical and political purposes unapprehended, unimagined. The example of the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster in the Gulf of Mexico three years ago is almost too neat in this context. One of the paradoxes of the spill's simultaneous hypervisibility and invisibility, its capacity to be imagined, was that the unprecedented ability to watch on YouTube the uncontrolled flow of oil from the ocean depths did not equate with and likely obstructed a capacity to to fathom the forms of harm being done. In this sense, it's no surprise that the combined effect of the chemical dispersant Corexit used by BP was to make the oil less visible, but far more toxic. Failures of the imagination often result from distance and difference, the difficulty of thinking across the gap from here to there. Not only geographical distance, but also historical time, whether imagining into the past or into the future, and other experiential divides. As a literary critic, my interest is in how different kinds of texts and cultural forms and different approaches to interpretation either participate in such processes of unimagining or work against them. Identifying and breaking through what we might call quarantines of the imagination is one of my main goals in reading, uh, one of my main goals in reading for the planet. Of course, with this title, Reading for the Planet, I have in mind a sense of environmental advocacy, reading for the sake of the earth, but also what is to me the far more interesting sense of an approach to interpretation, reading for images of the world as a conceptual, social, or ecological whole, as well as for traffic lines of power that and modes of inequality that stratify and divide. Reading for the planet is not disembodied global reading from nowhere, but rather reading from near to there, between specific sites and across multiple divides, with an eye toward the difficulty with which experience becomes unimaginable from another side. So in my talk today, I want to focus on two related examples of this failure of imagining that I'm calling unimagining. First, I want to examine how we understand the geographic, historical, and ethical relations involved in consumerism. Here, unimagining names the reluctance to understand the implications of one's consumption for people in other places and times. I'm also interested in the limits of gestures toward more conscious or ethical consumerism. In a recent article, I've called such gestures post-consumerism, and I think this was part of the talk that you saw in Connecticut. For the purposes of time, my consideration of consumerism and post-consumerism in this talk focuses on energy and particularly oil. My second main example of unimagining in this talk is the contemporary challenge of imagining a future indelibly shaped by climate change. In this section of the talk, I focus on the narrative genre of eco-apocalypse as a mode of imagining futurity. Here, too, I'm, I'm concerned with the limits of the genre, which I argue risk confusing space and time and leaving the future unimagined. 
So let me begin with the kind of imaginative divide or quarantine of the imagination that tends to separate people on the consumption end of consumer capitalism from the people and processes on the production end. We're all familiar with the habits of mind that are content to imagine that food comes from the grocery store or petrol comes from the pump without daring to th think any further back in the supply chain to the lives, livelihoods, and life worlds that the production of food and fuel touch upon, and not necessarily lightly or gently. Such passive contentment, I would argue, is an act of unimagining, keeping out of sight and out of mind the costs of one's consumption for other people. I'll just wait for the bicycle to get parked. <laughs> So I'm very interested in literary texts that bring such costs into view. Mil uh, Herman Melville's novel Moby Dick, for example, offers an account of 19th century globalization in which the whaling industry figures as the vanguard of imperialism's maps, <coughs> markets, and missionaries. The novel would have been impossible to write or interpret in the absence of a nascent global capitalism. As he traces the devious zigzag world circle of the Pequod's circumnavigating wake, Ishmael, the, novel, the novel's whaler slash narrator, brings home to his readers this bit of knowledge about whaling. Upon one particular voyage, which I made to the Pacific, we spoke with 30 different ships, every one of which had had a death by a whale, some of them more than one, and three each that had lost a boat's crew. For God's sake, be economical with your lamps and candles. Not a gallon you burn, but at least one man's blood was spilled for it. Ishmael brings home an uncomfortable truth to his readers who consume whale oil in order to consume books. He asks them to think beyond their cozy candlelit homes to the men who sail across the world and risk their lives to kill whales. He's not that worried about the whales, but he's worried about the men. Even as he implores his readers to be economical, Ishmael knows that they now know that men shed blood to fill their lamps, in whose glow they turn page after page after page after page of Moby Dick. In other words, for his own part, Melville seems not to have heeded this call to parsimony in calculating the ratios among gallons of ink, blood, and oil spilled for the sake of Moby Dick. This remarkable moment in Moby Dick offers a quintessential example of what I would call complicitous consumption, an epistemological and ethical predicament in which consumers know about the harm caused by their actions, but cannot or will not do anything to avoid such harm. Even though Moby Dick confronts stark truths about an energy regime that is now rather distant from our own, Ishmael's direct address to the reader momentarily narrows the gap between 19th and 21st century modes of combustion and their cost in human lives. Ishmael describes the exchange of blood for oil as an unfortunate necessity that demands mindful consumption, rather than a moral horror that necessitates a different geopolitics, as with the no blood for oil slogan inspired by the Gulf Wars of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Moby Dick asks its readers to become conscious of their consumption, of whale oil and the novel itself, to see themselves inscribed upon the map of the people Quad's zigzag world circle, and to begin to imagine what other might otherwise might seem unimaginable. A similar gesture appears in Nigerian poet Ogaga Ofowodo's The Oil Lamp, a long poem about the Niger Delta, published in 2005. The poem opens with a description of a year-long fuel crunch, a predicament of local scarcity amidst the inaccessible plenty of oil flowing through pipelines that carried away for consumption elsewhere. Ifoado's description of the fuel crunch provides context for his poetic account of a catastrophic fire in 1998, which killed more than 1,000 people who had gathered around the leaking pipeline trying to salvage petrol for local use. In the oil lamp, Ifoado gestures between this local context and sites far away at the pipeline's other end. This was how the damage was done, with old pipes corroded and cracked by the heat of their burden. Petrol and paraffin piped away from rotting dugouts and thatched huts to float ships and fly planes, to feed factories in the chain of ease, to make fortunes for faceless traders in markets without stalls or handmade goods. And let me just footnote this image and say once again, this is an image uh, photographed by Ed Kashi, 
And the photo also uses a photograph by Ed Kashi for the cover of his book, The Oil Lamp. So Kashi really has a kind of, not a monopoly, but he's really put his stamp on the photographic rendering of the Niger Delta. The photo offers an unfamiliar map of globalization that links the financialized, faceless abstractions of global markets with the rusted pipes and crude dwellings in the Niger Delta, a scene of poverty amidst capital-intensive resource extraction like the one Michael Watts has described as unimaginable. I'm particularly struck by the image of oil piped away to feed the chain of ease. Let me see if... Oh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, you can't see this nearly as well as one might hope. Anyway, um, the chain of ease is here. I, I'm afraid this might be a Mac to PC translation problem. I, I hadn't realized that um, you can't see it as well. Um, so the, the chain of ease, um, which is a suggestive metaphor that captures the shinier as well as the darker aspects of hydrocarbon-fueled modernity. This metaphor connotes both the privileged freedom of better living through petrochemistry, the chain of ease, and the constraint of being without alternatives to a mode of combustion that is unsustainable in every sense, the chain of ease. If Hobodo's poem works against the quarantines of the imagination that complicitous consumption demands, the obstacles that get in the way of following the pipeline or supply chain back to the site of production or forward to a changing climate. It implicitly asks readers who are encircled within the chain of ease to calculate the cost of petrol, not merely in terms of the price at the pump, but also the, co the costs borne by people far away, to recognize how their own lives are subsidized by the suffering of others whom they will never meet. Nemo Bossi, Director of Environmental Rights Action, Friends of the Earth and Benin City, Nigeria, offers an alternative accounting of the seeming cheapness of oil. He argues that poor people continue to subsidize the cost of crude oil through the losses they suffer in environmental services, quality of life, and extreme environmental degradation. Even and especially when gasoline prices are high, we don't necessarily feel that uh, petroleum is cheap these days, but even then these costs remain invisible, still unreflected in the, in the price fluctuations that consumers in the United States, at least, tend to interpret in terms of faraway events like military conflicts or natural disasters that th threaten to disrupt supply, rather than the everyday cost of business as usual. Oil lends itself in a very particular way to unimagining because it is probably the one commodity whose externalized costs consumers know the most about, or at least think they do. When the ideal of no blood for oil becomes a bumper sticker, Niger Delta residents distant complaints of having received no roads, schools, or hospitals in exchange for the oil pumped from beneath their homes becomes difficult to hear. Everyone in the United States knows by now that dependence on foreign oil, it's in quotation marks in my paper, dependence on foreign oil has profound costs, but these costs are too often perceived to be paid only in the currency of American lives and treasure. Working against such foreclosures of the geographic imagination, Bossi's analysis of the differences between the price of gas and the cost of oil as seen in the Niger Delta is an example of the kind of thinking I have in mind with Reading for the Planet. Of course, not all geographically expansive thinking about oil or about consumption more broadly has the positive ethical effects that we might hope. I want to gesture just briefly to a, an, ar uh, an argument I've made about a phenomenon called post-consumerism, um, which aspires to ethically motivated consumption for the common good. I have to say this is the coolest journal cover I've ever uh, I've been lucky enough to have uh, an article placed in. It's, it's uh, actually a man who... Um, is he has a band in Congo called Kanono Number no. One. It's electronic instruments salvaged from whatever he can he can find. Um, so post-consumerism, which I write about in this journal, um, offers the promise of helping the poor or saving the planet by buying things. The promise, in other words, of an escape from complicitous consumption. I'm skeptical about the extent to which post-consumerism does much good for anything beyond the consumer's sense of self-satisfaction. It may be that promises of a more just capitalism amount to little more than just more capitalism. <laughs>
And the epitome of this cynical business as usual guise of post-consumerism is this PR campaign for ethical oil. Um, I can't imagine you will have seen these images before, likely. Um, this is an attempt to construe the development of the tar sands as in Canada as a movement for social and political justice, right? So it's this whole series of not very subtle images um, so the, on the top we have the, the um, opposition between conflict oil and ethical oil in terms of labor, uh, in terms of environmental degradation. Let me point out um, <coughs> this uh, is a photograph by Ed Kashi of the Niger Delta, so it's circulating once again. So uh, reforestation is associated with ethical oil as opposed to the degradation in the Niger Delta. Uh, this is a kind of gender um, argument that oil countries so described involve uh, the uh, oppression of women as opposed to um, the election of a, a woman mayor, uh, repression of indigenous peoples. As I've said, these are not very subtle and very problematic distinctions that are being drawn here, all in the name of uh, kind of saying that there is no choice but to develop Canada's tar sands. Um, even the um, kind of um, gay pride gets associated with tar sands as opposed to persecution of homosexuals <coughs> elsewhere. Um, and there's a kind of militarist, uh, <laughs> um, vaguely uh, nationalist um, <coughs> idea that conflict oil funds terrorism, <coughs> ethical oil funds peacekeeping. Uh, democracy, dictatorship, you know, take your choice. Which one would you choose? This ethical oil is the choice that we have to make. Um, but the thing about this really striking visual shorthand is that it's really easily available. It really lends itself to uh, culture jamming or turning on its head. So there's an anti-ethical oil response that is instead of conflict oil versus ethical oil, we have immoral energy versus ethical energy. So it, to expand the rubric to energy and not just oil kind of opens the gate to thinking about other forms of energy. So energy at any price, the kind of uh, submersion of birds that are now <laughs> unidentifiable um, in oil as opposed to um, uh, protecting habitat for polar bears, our energy future, the real choice, right? So um, uh, tar sands destroy the planet, green economy saves the planet. Um, and kind of calling the bluff of um, the association of ethical oil with peace um, and thinking instead about militarism. And then the kind of punchline of the critique of ethical oil is actually kind of connecting <coughs> the dots between the companies that are involved in the development of Canadian tar sands and companies that are involved in what gets described as conflict oil and you know, literally connecting those dots and saying that they're really the same thing, right? The same companies are involved in both kinds of petroleum development. And I'm not sure how much play this issue has in the UK, but one thing to keep in mind about the tar sands is that it's a very dirty form of fuel, right? So there's a sense that there's as much carbon waiting to be uh, emitted into the atmosphere in the tar sands as has been emitted so far, right? And um, so it's a really kind of, I wouldn't even say a difficult choice that is being construed by the ethical oil um, um, effort as, as, as I said, a kind of social and political justice project. Although more concerned with the looming crisis of energy scarcity than the forms of environmental harm caused by energy consumption, Emory Zeman has powerfully described the current moment of fossil fuel capitalism as one of bad faith, caught in what he calls that yawning space between belief and action, knowledge and agency. This yawning space is not unlike that which Herman Melville's Ishmael creates for his readers, whom he asks to be mindful as they read Moby Dick. Seaman writes that we know where we stand with respect to energy and its limits, but we do nothing about it and cling to a fiction of surplus. Seaman's idea of bad faith, faith is another example of unimagining, the cognitive and political paralysis of knowing one's daily existence to be dependent upon resources and systems that are finite, harmful unsustain and unsustainable. In the face of such awareness of complicitous consumption, it's easy to stop thinking 
whether in resignation, terror, or some combination thereof, at the notion that the end of oil, or a climate transformed by oil, or alternatives to oil are all in their own ways unimaginable. There are understandable reasons for this bad faith. People remain attached to a quotidian, a quotidian existence they know is unsustainable because there seem to be no viable alternatives on offer and the desire to consume is shadowed by a desire not to know the effects of one's consumption. This is inertia, both in the colloquial sense of immobility, as well as the Newtonian sense of resistance to change in an object state, even a state of motion. The difficulty of changing the environmental order of things and slowing the momentum of harm. And I've recently started hearing proponents of renewable energy in the United States saying that the largest obstacle to the transition to clean energy is the widespread assumption that there is no viable alternative to oil. In other words, in this line of argument, an alternative energy future is actually mo much closer than we might think, and a broad public failure to imagine alternatives to oil gets in the way of bringing them online. I hear kind of Margaret Thatcher's there is no alternative as the kind of shadow um, to this. In the context of North American energy politics of the moment, the sense that there is no alternative to oil can also generate support for the use of hydraulic fracturing to extract natural gas, another major issue in uh, North American energy politics, or for the completion of the Keystone XL pipeline to carry Canadian tar sands to the U.S. Gulf Coast. In other words, instead of investing in natural gas or tar sands as a bridge to a post-oil future assumed to be very far away, why not build that future now? I want to turn now to consider more explicitly the question of the future, and particularly the future of climate change, as a particular challenge to the imagination in both geographic and historical terms. This is the second example of unimagining that I'll talk about. Climate change asks us to understand the history of modernity anew as a history of rapidly increasing carbon emissions, which in the recent accounts of historians like Dupesh Chakraborty and Tim Mitchell, directly fueled such developments as the European Enlightenment, urban settlement, industrialization, organized labor, and democracy itself. The aftermath and afterlife of this carbon history will long remain with us in the not yet realized atmospheric effects of burning in the matter of a few centuries, fuels that it took millions of years to fossilize. The effects of this rapid combustion of deep time are expected to endure a thousand years into the future as the harm the body of the planet remembers. And you can see that there's an inverse relation between regions with high carbon emissions, which are noted in red, and uh, regions which are expected to escape the most uh, severe effects of climate change. In other words, regions that have uh, emitted the least carbons will have the strongest uh, effects. As a literary critic, I'm interested in whether the narrative forms and literary modes of imagining futurity that we have available to us are adequate for apprehending the ch challenges posed by climate change. For the purposes of my talk today, I want to focus on eco-apocalypse, a narrative form that I argue tends to shut down rather than open up the crucial work of imagining the future. In some ways, eco-apocalypse seems premised on offering a compelling account of alternative worlds radically different from our own. Perhaps we might say that eco-apocalypse aims to vividly imagine the unimaginable. But I want to suggest that the limitations of eco-apocalypse risk leaving the future unimagined in any meaningful way. Imagining the future is hard work these days. What distinguishes our contemporary <coughs> moment might be the imaginative inertia of its utopias, or at least the visions of a better world imagined from within the chain of ease. These not so visionary visions dream of nothing so much uh, as the continuation of the status quo, a future alternative ideal that is basically life as it is now, with, uh, sorry, basically life as it is now, with all of the costs still externalized, the present transformed only in so far as we won't have had to change very much. Although premised on radical difference from our world, eco-apocalypse too, in seizing the imagination, can get in the way of imagining futurity meaningfully and might be better understood as unimagining the future, rendering it still unimaginable. <coughs> 
Both environmentalists and their opponents have long worried about the limits of using apocalyptic fears about the future to mobilize change. I share those concerns that images of our own destruction can generate either denial or a literary pleasure of catharsis, neither of which does much to loosen attachments to the status quo. Paradoxically, as Frederick Buell points out, apocalypse seems almost too easy. With a big bang, it and we are over and done with. But I want to raise a different concern about the political liabilities of eco-apocalypse. As the narrative expression of a crisis of futurity, eco-apocalypse can fundamentally misrecognize the present. The imaginative lore of eco-apocalypse can obscure attention to the more mundane crisis of futurity theorized by the anthropologist James Ferguson from the vantage point of Africa or Mary Louise Pratt from Latin America. Ferguson observes that mid 20th century promises of modernization have been abandoned and narratives of development disavowed. The industrialized affluent West was once construed as a possible future for the rest of the world, but now Ferguson argues the progress narrative of history has reverted to the stasis of hierarchy. The notion of Africans being behind Europe, which was always a problematic notion, has returned to a sense that they're simply beneath. Inequality is imagined to endure into an indefinite future of longing for infrastructure. Mary Louise Pratt, from whom I borrow the phrase crisis of futurity, sees this crisis in her words all over the planet, among people who live conscious of their redundancy to a global economic order which is able to make them aware of its existence and their super, to, sorry, make them aware of its existence and their superfluity, expelled from its narratives of futurity. And television, I would argue, is crucial to this awareness among those have been, who have been evicted from the future. Residents of the Niger Delta describe the predicament of underdevelopment in terms of its contrast with the good life as described on TV. The excluded have vivid images of what they're being excluded from, precisely because the global culture industry circulates images of affluence much more widely than global capitalism distributes wealth. So the challenge, as I see it, is to calibrate these different but not unrelated crises of futurity, the future loss to climate change as the belated cost of modernity's chain of ease, as opposed to the sense of never having enjoyed the benefits of, moder of modernity to begin with. In the helpful formulation of Daniel Anderson, this is the challenge of thinking between the accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere and the accumulation of capital. One of Rob Nixon's key insights in his book, Slow Violence, is that human vulnerability to environmental harm is, in his words, unevenly universal. Or we could say inflected by histories of unequal relation to both kinds of accumulation, carbon and capital. I would argue that to focus on the universality of vulnerability to environmental harm at the expense of, of the unevenness, to move too quickly to ideas of humans as a single community on one planet, is not so much a quarantine as it is a gentrification of the imagination, a gesture toward new forms of universalism that is blind to the displacements that it causes. Narratives of eco-apocalypse can affect such a gentrification of the imagination if time and futurity become an axis of difference that displaces geographic distance and the axis of socioeconomic inequality in the present. And to demonstrate what I mean by the problem of, of conflating space and time in eco-apocalypse,